have Professor Nielsen here. So thank you very much for coming. I'm very much not an archaeologist, and I'm not trained in anthropology. Uh, my background is in evolutionary biology, it's in genetics, it's also in statistics, I do a lot of machine learning and so on, uh, but I'm going to be completely honest about the fact that I really don't know anything about archaeology. But I talk to a lot of archaeologists, because what I do is trying to in interpret and pronounce the genetic data, and then to understand what that means, we need to talk to the archaeologists that have the experience. Uh, and understand the, the context uh, of, of the data. And unfortunately, I haven't been speaking to people at Berkeley. I've been speaking to people all over the world, but never to anybody at Berkeley. But I'm very uh, eager to get to know people at Berkeley that are, are do archaeology and interested in, uh, in uh, archaeology in general and might actually be able to, to help me understand things better than I don't understand. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where, how I come into the whole analysis of uh, uh, ancient DNA, um, this is the main topic of, of this talk. And uh, my background, as I said, is really statistics and, and genetics, not just human genetics, and my lab is done on frogs and lizards and, and other things as well. But we've also been doing human genetics, and um, mostly because what we do is we develop statistical methods, computation methods for analysis of the genetic data. So we get to also have the privilege to be involved in many, many different projects uh, because of, of that. And one of the projects I got involved in uh, very early on in, 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 the, in terms of genomics was the sequencing of the first uh, ancient, uh, or the sequencing of the first Asian uh, genome. And raised the question, so now it was the third human genome that was ever sequenced, the first representative uh, from anybody from Asia. Uh, I collaborated with some Chinese collaborators on, on this project. And it raised the question, what can we learn from sequencing the genome of an individual? And that was basically the question that goes to me, we have sequenced this genome, uh, what can you tell us uh, now that we have sequenced this genome? And uh, of course, main interest is a lot of functional stuff. So what's the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease and diabetes, and hypertension and so on? And one part of what we work on is how can we best predict that? So how can you help improve healthcare by analyzing these genomes? How can you uh, help predict disease risk and so on? So that's one thing that we did. But you want to realize when we do that, that despite our successes in, in genomics, our ability to predict phenotypes uh, are still pretty uh, poor, particularly complex phenotypes that we learn a lot about. I work a lot on type 2 diabetes, and our ability to use DNA to predict who will get type 2 diabetes is still pretty poor. Okay, you're much better off just with a blood sample and measuring triglyceride levels and so on. You told much more than by sequence in the genome. So there are lots of uh, so in terms of being a genomicist and having been part of the whole process of take my PhD before we sequence the human genome, going into the genome, uh, genome sequencing to after we have the genome, one of the disappointments I think is how little we can actually say from genomics and perhaps the promises of genomics were, were exaggerated. But one thing that uh, we learned is um, that even though our ability to predict phenotypes we can actually learn a lot about the history of the population and individual come from from just one genome. And why is that? Why is one genome, it's just one individual, why does that really tell us that much? It's because that individual had two parents. They each had two parents. So if you go back in time, one genome represent a whole lot of individuals' ancestry back in time. So there's lots and lots of rich information about the genetic history of the population uh, back in time, represented by just a single genome. And that's something that we take advantage of in a number of, of projects. Now, I think it's very important when you do this type of genetics to be aware of what can you say something about the genetics and what can you not say something about. So the things that we can say something about, and that you will know from forensic genetics, from the OJ Simpson trial and so on, we can say something about are individuals genetic related, right? So like a paternity test and so on. But we can also ask, you know, are they, uh, you know, what's the chance that it's a grandparent and offspring, or they are separated by four or five generations, or further back in the past, for example. We say something about the degree of relatedness. And then we say something about, with increasing uncertainty, how long time ago we share a common ancestor. If we take two of us in the room, we can make some estimates of how long time since we had a common ancestor, the two of us, that we shared an ancestor. We start making statements about that. And that's basically what the genetics is about. Okay. And everything else is interpretation. On top of that. Okay, so what we cannot learn, at least directly from genetics, is you know what are the 
cultures associated with remains we're looking at, of course. Uh, transmission and origin of cultures, the genetics in itself doesn't say anything about that. Transmission and origin of languages, and also the physical location of ancestors. So I think some of the first ones should be pretty obvious. The last one, people often make lots of mistakes in my opinion because of that, because you make sort of these maps of how people move around the world, and there's some implicit assumptions about where these ancestors were located. But of course, the DNA itself does not come with a stack of geographical locations, except for the one individual, the few individuals who have to analyze it. The ancestors are not. Uh, are not. doesn't come with uh, any kind of geolocation. So the physical location of ancestors also indirectly because there's been a lot of controversy also, for example, origin of languages. So how much can you say you can show that some individuals are related to each other and some you know and further spoke some type of language? What the self did I tell you about the transmission of the languages? There are a number of controversies on that. And I will not go into that because uh, I feel that I think um, much of these controversies really are on uh, our interpretation rather than on the genetics. And I'd rather stay with the I'm going to start with talk about, I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects. I'm going to talk, talk, start by talking about the Neanderthal Genome Project. So, a part of the group that inspired the Pablo's group, uh, he sequenced the first Neanderthal DNA. So, this is from a, uh, apparently a Neanderthal bone. Where they, what they do is they, they drill in, in the bone, get a little bit of tissue out, and then try to extract DNA from that. And uh, when Sinai Pablo sequenced the first Neanderthal uh, genome, uh, I've been working on methods to try to detect. Had them, if there had been integration in a population without knowing the dome. So what is integration? It's a transfer of genetic uh, material from, from species or subspecies or different populations to another by interbreeding. And at this point when doing this, a lot of controversy about had there been the big interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans. Uh, and there were varying opinions about that. The most common opinion was that there had been no interbreeding. But there are also people that argued that there had to be interbreeding, and a lot of controversy about that. So I work on these methods, and then I contact this one, the Pavos uh, project group, and what they agreed is on that, uh, that they would send me, you know, I would send predictions of what in the human genome had come in from the Neanderthal. And then they would compare that to their Neanderthal sequence to see if my predictions were right. And this is one of the several value process, uh, approaches they used to see if there in fact had been Neanderthal uh, integration. So a little bit about the methods that we use for, for doing that. So we're looking for genetic regions that had the following property that if you take uh, Europeans or could be an Asian, that the lineage falls way outside the genetic diversity all by see among humans. So are looking for segments of the genomes that you find in people outside Africa, by outside Africa, because it's suppo they're supposed not to have been Neanderthals in, Af in, in Africa. We would expect the integration only outside Africa. So we're looking for particular segments of the genome that had these very, very large divergence times between that segment and other human segments that fell generally outside the whole human genetic variability. And then it would be our candidate regions for integration, for DNA that has been transferred by interbreeding between uh, some other hominid and then into humans and the Neanderthal was there. The way we do that is we then can look at where the mutations have happened on that gene tree that we're looking at, a little local gene tree in the genome, reflecting the, the genetic history just of that little part of the genome. And then we put on all these mutations, and then we can identify these mutations as diagnostic mutations that should tell us about uh, Neanderthal DNA. So during that, we come up with a prediction uh, of a number of regions. These are regions that looked like there was uh, evidence of hominin, or integration from another hominin into uh, modern humans uh, outside that. And then what uh, some Pablo's group could do, they could then look at the diagnostic snaps that we had predicted we would find in the, in the Neanderthal. Who are they in fact in the Neanderthal? And, and in almost all the cases, except the last two cases here, we found there was almost a complete match. So for example, there's you know, 21 mutations that are really rare for humans that we predicted you should then find it in the Neanderthals, as they had all of those in that particular fragment, for example. And then we do various statistics on top of that, and show that this degree of similarity, we couldn't get that uh, without some kind of, of, of integration the way we've done it. There was many other arguments going into showing the fact that there had been integration between uh, from Neanderthals uh, into modern humans outside Africa. Uh, 
uh, I think that's widely accepted now that that is uh, in fact the case. Now the question that then arises from this is, well, when did that happen? When did humans and Neanderthals interbreed? Um, and there have been lots of discussions about that. And there are various ways that we try to estimate that. And we like to use what I think is the most precise way of estimating it, is to look at what's called the length of a mixture of fragments. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes trying to, trying to uh, explain what I um, mean by a mixture of fragments. So imagine that you have uh, an F1 hybrid, so to speak. So you have the first generation descendant of a uh, offspring between uh, Neanderthals and humans. So you might have a particular part of your genome, you might have one genome that, or one DNA string from one of your parents, say the red one here, that is human, and another one, the blue one, that is the Neanderthal genome. Okay, so what happens is if then that individual then breeds with other humans, is that the fra fragment will become longer, or shorter, sorry, because of the process of recombination. Let me just explain that for a second. So, you have one piece of DNA from your mother, another piece of DNA from your father. As you produce germ cells, and you produce egg cells and sperm cells, they send off to the next generation. Those chromosomes get aligned with each other during the process of cell division called meiosis. And when that happens, DNA is switched between the two chromosomes. So, the maternal chromosome might get some of the maternal DNA, the maternal chromosome might get some of the paternal DNA. That's a process, a process called recombination. That happens. So in the next generation, there might be a recombination event. So you might get a chromosome here that has is, has some human DNA and some Neanderthal DNA. And I should say, when I say the word human here, in contrast to Neanderthal, I will, you know, I just use it as a way to describe modern humans versus Neanderthal. I'm not making sort of statements about what are species and so on. I try to avoid that discussion. Uh, so I hope you'll allow me to use those words human and Neanderthal without having to defend myself in terms of how I define species. Um, so, as time goes on, you will see that you know you will have you can have more recombination events, and these fragments in the uh, segregates in the human population as they pass on from generation to generation, then become they become shorter and shorter. And the kind of thing that we do in my lab is that we then make models of this. We're saying, okay, how long if the mixture time is thirty thousand years ago, seventy thousand years ago, how long should the distribution of these fragments be? How can we basically infer these fragments and then from that infer when the integration event happened? So we've been doing a lot of work on that. And we think now that the integration time is about 55,000 years. Okay. So these fragments are so short that it corresponds to about 50,000 years. It's important, the data is important not just for the sort of context about when did this happen. It's important also for another reason that is it could definitely not go back to the time of the most recent common ancestor. Of humans, uh, of, of, of humans and Neanderthals. That's way further back in time uh, than this. It must be because there's been breeding, interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals since they split off from each other. Okay, so that's why the recent data is also important for that. I should also say that this is an average. Okay, so there could have been, in fact, multiple bouts of integration. It could have been a longer period. But if you're making a model where you say there was only, it only happens one period in time. So these two populations emerge. That's the estimate you get. And there's uh, some debate on how many Neanderthal integrations that actually happened to humans and, and when they happen. This is, if you only assume one, that is the data that you get. So we're getting now a model of human evolution where we have this Neanderthal integration. And of course, we now know there are all hominins present, particularly Denisovans. Uh, we also work a bit on that. I'm not going to say more of that, but I think we're getting more and more at a, a view of human evolution that is more of a merger of the traditional out of Africa and the regional models where we more think of human evolution being somewhere in between that, where there have been multiple different populations that have interbred with each other and that human evolution is not really sort of a tree. It's more uh, formed by different uh, populations moving around and then in some sense evolving to certain degree together. So if you ask me, 15 years ago, what did I think about human evolution? Or you ask any geneticist, the geneticist would very much have a view of a, of a sort of a tree. You know, people move out of Africa and so on. Of the, the out of Africa events had completely replaced everybody that were out there. Previously, uh, of no inside Africa, hominin integration, which we now also see uh, 
evidence for and, and, and so on. And I think we get a different view now uh, of what human evolution really has been about. Now, another interesting question then is, um, okay, so has there been any, has these two genomes met? You know, you form a new organism with genomes that have been separated for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, is there any natural selection acting in that process? That's something we've been very interested in. We are working on natural selection a lot. It's sort of one of the core research areas. We're working on many different organisms trying to find natural selection. And there's been papers, not published by us, but by, published by other people, that are arguing that uh, there's in fact been a lot of um, natural selection in humans against Neanderthal DNA. So that Neanderthal DNA has been purged out of the human genome. One of the arguments came from uh, plots like this, where you take for different individuals who time estimate the amount of Neanderthal DNA, and you see there's a dis decreasing proportion of Neanderthal DNA. This particular study has lately, uh, recently been criticized. People argue that there's in fact an estimation, estimation bias. So uh, there's some controversy in the field about whether this is actually real, that there's this decrease of the NFL DNA because of purging. But we have much better evidence that shows that in fact there has been selection against uh, the NFL DNA. And it comes from some different papers that all show the same thing that if you look at the human genome, where there are functional genes, where there's some genes that are supposed to important for fitness, they have important functions, there's less than any animal DNA in those regions than in part of the genome that doesn't isn't associated with any function. So the neutral parts of the genome, the ones that we think are not constrained by natural selection, have more animal DNA than the parts of the genome that are under selection to stay the same. Okay. And there's really no process that will generate this pattern without natural selection acting to perch the Neanderthal DNA. That's the only, only explanation we really have to that. So the question is, okay, why is, why is that happening? And there's basically two competing theories. One theory is that genetic incompatibilities has evolved between Neanderthals and modern humans. We basically have be evolved to become partially separated species that now have the genetics that were incompatible with each other. Now, that hypothesis requires that there are thousands of positions in the human genome and the animal genome that have these kind of incompatibilities. Incompatibilities like that are hard to evolve. Why are they hard to evolve? Because if you have a new mutation in humans that creates incompatibility with a previous version, that will just be eliminated, right? Because that will selection will act against that. So the only way you can get these incompatibilities is that you have a mutation in humans that in itself is not bad for you. And then in the animal they get a separate mutation, they're also not bad for you. But then there's somehow there's an interaction between those two new two new mutations, so that if you bring the genomes together, then there's an incompatibility. So there's not a theory of this, this is something that should happen quite slowly. So there's another possibility for what could have happened. Why there has been selection against Neanderthal DNA? That possibility is that the Neanderthals has a much lower effective population size in humans. We know that. They have very small populations. That leads to high inbreeding, and that leads to an accumulation of deleterious mutations. So, you know, inbred organisms, they tend to not be well off. Many endangered species, they're endangered because the population size now is so small that they get too many deleterious mutations and accumulating the actual selection can't get rid of it. And we think, and there's lots of evidence, that was going on in the animal So, we have models of that. So, we can model, um, we have very simple models of human evolution uh, with a bottleneck at some point in time and then expansion. These values here are effective population sizes, which also are vastly smaller than the actual number of individuals in the population. What we can estimate is that Neanderthal population size is about the tenth of human population size, and was that for quite a long time. And that would lead to accumulation in, in deleterious mutations to a higher degree in Neanderthals than humans. Now, what we also have are we have estimates of what is called here the distribution of fitness effects. What is that? We can take from modern human data, we can dis estimate. How many mutations are there of different fitness effects? So that means that they, they affect uh, reproduction or survivability in a certain way. And we can estimate, it's very hard to estimate for a particular mutation, but we can estimate the whole distribution. So if we take a model like this, which is not from us, but from other people, put together with a model like that, also from other people, of the distribution of fitness effect, we can look at what would be the relative fitness of Neanderthals and modern humans at the time they met. The scale also had relative to the fitness of modern humans. And this is the distribution of fitness. There will be a distribution in the population, of course. Some individuals will randomly have more deleterious mutations than others. 
And what you can see here is that there's a substantially lower relative thickness of the nuclear force. That's what you would predict simply based on what you estimate in humans on distribution of thickness effects and of the history of Neanderthals in humans. And from that, we can then predict, okay, would we see a pattern like what we see in the real data that there's this paucity of Neanderthal DNA around regions of the genome that are functionally important, that there's too few Neanderthal fragments in the genome near protein coding genes. And without dragging too much through the details, yes, we can, we can explain exactly the, what you see in, in the real data. So this also makes an odd prediction. This makes that this selection that has been against Neanderthal DNA would actually mean that the proportion of Neanderthals that would have contributed to that mixture is much larger initially. But then there was all this selection to get rid of it. And if you try to estimate it using these kind of models, there's no way to get a good fit to the pattern you see in the genome without having about 10% Neanderthal mixture. Okay, so initially you would have an mixture where about 10% of the DNA comes from the Neanderthals. And that's interesting because it corresponds to that 1 to 10 ratio of how many humans to Neanderthals has been estimated to be there. So what that suggests is really that the Neanderthal extinction was not really an extinction. It was more like an absorption. The two species met and then they started interbreeding. There were more humans than Neanderthals, so that's much more human DNA. And then the Neanderthal DNA had many more deleterious mutations so that through time was eliminated from the population. That's in some sense the best fitting model if you should believe the genetic data, that the Neanderthal extinction was perhaps uh, an absorption. But it happened also because the Neanderthals already had really low fitness because they had low effective population sizes, so arguments about carrying capacity for Neanderthals and so on is part of the story as well. Because it only works because they, to a start, had very low uh, population sizes. Okay, so that was the uh, Neanderthal genome projects and a little bit of the things that we were doing recently to try to understand the genomic pattern uh, of in, in the Neanderthals uh, and humans and what it might mean uh, with regards to the process of uh, doing this Neanderthals and human effect. So now I'm going to switch to a much more recent time scale that perhaps from some of you is more, more interesting um, and talk a little bit about various projects we've been involved in uh, on more recent human remains. So uh, the first Ancient human that was ever sequenced was a project I was involved with with uh, my collab long time collaborator in Copenhagen, Eskild Billslev. I used to before I was Berkeley, I, had, I was a professor in Copenhagen and we started working together back then. And he is one of the leading researchers in ancient DNA in the world. And so I've been helping him with many, many data analysis for many of his projects. And the one of the first projects we did um, in humans was this uh, Sakak genome project. That was the first ancient human genome that was ever sequenced. And uh, just a little background, many of you might know the background better than me, but I'm just going to give you what I know about it. We have a Sakak uh, culture that existed from about uh, uh, 2500 BCE to about 800 BCE. These are some of the archaeological sites where you find that culture. Uh, the Sakak people, they were mostly reindeer and musk ox uh, hunters and hadn't uh, really specialized uh, on uh, fishing and hunting marine mammals in the same way as. Uh, some of the modern Arctic uh, people have been doing. So if you look for time, uh, later on, uh, you will have a replacement of this Kakko culture with the Dorset culture uh, uh, in the um, north, north, eastern Canada and up in, in Greenland. Uh, the Dorset culture then later get replaced by the Thule culture, which is an early culture uh, associated at least to the, to the modern Inuit culture. Uh, and that's a culture then that's associated with what we know about the Inuit today, uh, specialization in uh, hunting, uh, you know, life on the ice, and, and hunting uh, 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 from the marine mammals, uh, and so on, kayaks and, and, and all of that. Um, so the question is, at this point when this project was, was the Sakak people, were they, you know, they were not, there were, there were some controversies about this, where the culturally the ancestors of the Inuit, there's some similarities, but a lot of differences too. Was it just a, uh, a replacement, uh, you know, but it was essentially just the Sakak people that eventually uh, became, uh, they, they invented the, the Inuit culture and became the Inuit, or was these two different people? And here we get into sort of a little bit of minefield, because there are really two statements here I'm conflating with all. So one about the history of uh, the sort of biological history, and then there's a cultural history. Okay. 
And that always becomes a little bit uh, dangerous. So what I can tell you about is the biological history. And then I need people like you to tell me about the cultural history. So I can tell you for the physical remains that we're looking at who are related to. Okay, and then you 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 can help me with the with the cultural context of that and why that what that might have meant. And I realized that there might be different interpretations of that. So the same we were working on was that tuft of hair that um, had been lying in the museum, I guess in there. You know, that, that's not too uncommon, and that was uh, anthropologists, archaeologists have come up in Greenland, and then part of, uh, they also find human remains, and those human remains have then been lying in a, in a museum uh, in, in Denmark. So this is that uh, tuft of hair here. And one of the first things you look at, you can't really see it on this slide, I'm sorry about that, is when you look at what's the, you know, how well preserved is the hair compared to modern hair. Okay, it turns out it's quite well preserved. If it's not well preserved, what you'll see is that there's a lot of mycelium going through, you can see fungus that will be going, uh, going through the hair and so on. And this, as far as, as uh, ancient samples go, archaeological samples, is pretty well preserved. And it was perhaps not surprising to him, given the conditions uh, it, had, it, had, it had been under. So very conducive for extracting DNA. So the DNA was extracted from the, from the hair itself. You want to make sure to, for ancient DNA, to avoid the hair follicle because that's usually highly contaminated with the fungus and bacteria, so you take the hair itself. Now, actually, the best thing right now is actually to work on the petrous bone uh, in the skull. The petrous bone is, you know, not really talking about something I don't know anything about. But I've been told that it's very dense and has conditions that are very good for DNA preservation and very, very rarely contaminated. Okay, so most studies try not to work on this uh, petrous bone, but hair is also good to have although it can be heavily contaminated. So what you do is that you then take the hair, run it up, you extract DNA, and then you sequence. And then you find that maybe 98% of the DNA you get is bacterial DNA, or it is fungal DNA, or it's something else. But it, some of it is human DNA. And so you just sequence and sequence and sequence until you have enough human DNA to make a genome. And that's one of the reasons why, and that's the technique that has been used in at least early studies, and we're still using that in many studies. That's one of the reasons why ancient DNA studies uh, are so expensive, because you have to sequence so much to get the endogenous DNA out, because there's usually so much contamination. You can deal with it bioinformatically, you can get rid of all the contamination, it's no longer really a problem for inferences and so on, but it's a, a financial problem, because we have to spend so much money on DNA sequencing to get a, a genome out. So what we have a, a genome like that, a secret of genome, what we can do then is that we can then compare it to reference panel of modern humans, for example. And back then we didn't really have any other reference panels, now we have a lot of uh, genomes from other ancient DNA, but we can compare it to a reference panel. And one of the most simple ways that people do this is made a PCA plot, and you might have seen these kind of plots before. It's, uh, you know, it takes major axis of variation in your data and then summarizes uh, yeah, graphically. Uh, the, how uh, the different individuals you have that relate to these major axes of variation. And you see here, there are reference panels from people from the Americas, Europeans, East Asians, and South Siberians. And then you also have some East Siberians here, and then if you put the Sakak sample on, it falls right here, near the Siberians. And that answers one important question, that the closest one genetically, the ones that the Sakak shares relatives with most recently, and we can show them many other ways that are more refined than, than this sort of uh, crude way of doing it. The closest relatives are in fact people that today live in East Siberia. It's not modern Inuit people. Okay. And so that, that, and we can estimate in fact when this year ancestors. So the ancestors with Inuit people goes back quite far in time. Uh, and as public distribution, we have more sophisticated estimates of it. Now, at that point, we estimate it as maybe something like 15,000 years, whereas the and is common ancestry with the East the Siberians is maybe only 5,000 years. Okay, so that suggests that there must there will have been this expansion of the Sakak, which also is fits well with the archaeological evidence uh, from an area in the eastern parts of Siberia near Beringia here, uh, quite fast, uh, eventually we reaching uh, Western Greenland um, by the estimates of these time since they had ancestors. So of course, the whole movement of people, now that's an inference of what right? I don't know that, I know who they're related to today, and from that, we can sort of uh, surmise that there might have been this uh, uh, 
equation. And if that also seems to have some support from archaeological evidence, we can build a case for this. But it's of course important that we are aware that the migration itself is an indirect inference. The genetic relationship is a direct inference. Okay, so we kept working on, on various issues relating to Arctic people for a while. Uh, and one of the issues that we were also interested in was the, then the Dorset culture. How, how did that fit in with this? And here's another sort of way of visualizing some of the results. And this is in terms of a tree. And I should give you a warning when I tell you this tree that if you're familiar with evolutionary biology, you're familiar with you know, describing the world in terms of evolutionary tree. This is tree here described a type of uh, genetic relatedness among individuals. And it, you'll get a tree even if the way that these uh, people have evolved from each other is not tree-like at all, but by migration back and forth in the rest of it. Still be, you will still summarize the genetic relatedness in terms of the tree. And that's what we're doing here. We know that, that in fact, this is not uh, really a, an accurate representation of really the history because human divergence and evolution doesn't work by different populations splitting up from each other and never meeting again, as might be implicit or might be implied by tree like this. But what we see here is, one of the things we can see is that we find that the Dorset the uh, DNA from remains from people from the Dorset culture groups together with the Sakak culture and not together with uh, people from the Inuit cultures. And we find that consistently, no matter how we do the analysis. And what we think now is that, in fact, there's strong evidence that uh, there's not much genetic relatedness between the, the Sakak and Dorset people and the Inuit people, except that there was some subsequent gene flow between them. So they, there was some interbreeding between them, but originally they were more uh, separated from each other. So people like to make figures like this, and again there's a lot of interpretation here um, of what's going on, but the main sort of take home message is that, that it seems like that the genetic data are most compatible, or very compatible with the idea that there were two really two active migration work for the world that both came from around uh, the Bering Strait here. Uh, and there was first an early one uh, that led to the Sakak culture, and then a later one uh, that is associated with, with the Tula and Inuit culture that then uh, replaced, biologically replaced, uh, the Sakak um, And that seems at least to be the, the genetic story, and it, uh, it's also compatible with evidence that you have Inuit cultures, cultures very close, close way to Inuit cultures. In uh, Alaska, Western Alaska, uh, uh, so it seems to also be quite compatible with much of the archaeological evidence. And there are other people before us that have proposed this scenario. This doesn't just come from the genetics. The genetics is certainly very compatible here. Okay, so that was the, the Arctic people, um, which is one of the uh, groups that we find in North America today. So we've been very interested in this problem of the peopling of the Americas. Uh, and one of the first study we did that was actually by, uh, by sort of by accident. We were studying a completely different culture. So we're interested in this, the Matabu Red culture. And I saw there was some cast out there actually, were just as I was coming in here from that culture. That's kind of interesting. So the, the Matabu Red culture, I'm being told, is a culture that you find in sort of southern part of Siberia, uh, northern Asia, about 24,000 to about 50,000 years before present. Uh, and it's characterized by various uh, logical remains, including they have these dwellings that they built up with reindeer antlers, and bones, and so on, and then uh, skin on top. And then it's also been associated with these uh, Venus uh, figurines that, you know, from the Upper Paleolithic, you also find throughout Europe. So when first this culture was discovered, there was a lot of interest in maybe is there a shared culture uh, that goes all the way from Europe and then into much of uh, Asia. You can probably educate me much more about that uh, discussion. But of course, it leads to then some interest in are these people, when we have remains from them, are they then genetically related to people in Europe? That led to that question. Uh, this was sort of a similar project that was really led by you know, questions posed to us uh, from archaeologists. So we have uh, one sample. In this project, as we had a call, but one that was sequenced really, really well, we've got really high quality data from the Matar 1 sample, which was dated about 24,000 years before present. And just to show you on the map, uh, that's here. We also have some, some other samples in the same study right here. And then we ask the question again okay, so these 
Now tag people, who were they related to? And one way to visualize it, another way to visualize it, could be through a map like this. So here there's a color coding of people all over the world. And the more blue you are, down to black, the less related you are to those people genetically. And the more red it is, the more related you are. And if you take the Mantai, this is for the Mantai individual. You can see that the Mantai individual is actually not closer related to many uh, Europeans now than they are to many people in Asia. So there seemed to be a connection there. But, and this was a big surprise, they were way more related to people in the Americas, to Native Americans. They were strongly related to Native Americans. So that was a huge surprise, way more strongly related to Native Americans than, say, East Asian side, or many of the, or basically any of the uh, Arctic people in, um, uh, that are in, the, in, in Siberia today. So what we could infer had, 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 is going on, uh, the genetic data tells us it's going on, is that if you take modern Native Americans, they can largely be understood as having two genetic components that Help, uh, that formed that, that group. One genetic component that was related to this maritime individual, and another genetic component related to uh, East Asia. Okay. So Mantara itself is mostly related, in fact, to Europeans. And that solved a problem in the field, that when people have been analyzing uh, DNA from Native Americans, they actually noticed that there was this sort of genetic affinity to Europeans. And in the beginning, everybody thought, okay, it's just because, of course, Colonial, you know, you know, post-colonial mixture between uh, Native Americans and European co colonialists that come in country with DNA and so on. Uh, but then, as we got better and better data, we could kind of exclude that. Uh, we could estimate that it couldn't be from that. So it seems to be that you know, I don't know how well you know that field, but there are all these solutory and hypotheses, hypotheses about Europeans coming into the Americas and so on. That whole problem was solved with this. It's because the original population, at least through the foundation of uh, pretty much all Native Americans, except for some of these active people. They were themselves, and it makes a composite of different populations that live in Asia. People associated or related to the Maltapa Red culture, and then individuals related to uh, East Asians. All right, so that tells so a little bit about what happens in the formation of uh, uh, Native Americans biologically, genetically. Um, of course, we're also interested in what happens uh, then inside the Americas. And uh, of course, the first unique culture we really have in, in the Americas is the Clovis culture. A long time people felt, thought that the Clovis culture was the first, those were the first people in the Americas. I think now there's lots of evidence suggesting that they were not the uh, first people that are older, archaeologically, that they uh, remains in the Americas are not Clovis. Again, now I'm lecturing about something that you know much better than I do. Uh, but this is just the sort of uh, sort of preamble for what I'm going to say next. Um, we're interested, of course, then what is, you know, and the question is what's going on with, uh, with the Clovis culture, where they come from, and how they relate to modern Native Americans. And for this particular project, um, my collaborator is Willis that was contacted by a person in the United States that had. Uh, you know, an old, an old baby essentially in the closet, so to speak. So they, once those, as Ansic one boy, as a boy that was one to two years old, date about uh, twelve and a half thousand years old, that this family has had in the, in the closet. So there's nothing more sacred in America than, you know, the right to own your own property and anything you find on your own property. So if you find the remains of a person in your own property, that belongs to you. You have ownership of that. So they had, this family has had this Ansic one boy in their literally in the closet, in the, in the house, for a long time. And this person then contacted us to say, oh, should we do some DNA on that? And he then contacted the local tribe. So there's lots of issues there. So it's private land. So all, you know, all the, the, the NACPRA and that, that does apply uh, when it's on, on private land. But uh, ESC, uh contact had been working with Native American groups before, and he contacted some of the local Native Americans uh, in the area um, and discuss the issue with it. And they said they would, you know, the local tribal council uh, granted, argued that, you know, they would be okay with doing analysis and so on and as long as it was repatriated to them afterwards. So that was sort of an agreement that was made where they said, uh, said yes to uh, repatriating it, uh, repatriating these uh, remains voluntarily. So 
if you look at doing a DNA analysis and we do it like this again, you see again that we always see that this NC1 individual, the NC1 boy, in fact is closely related to uh, modern Native Americans. If you look at it in terms of this tree, or we can look at it this <coughs> in terms of reference panels who are the NC4 mostly related to and mostly people in Central and South America. So in other studies, what we've been able to show is that uh, there seems to be evidence of really sort of two major groups of uh, Native Americans and Northern group and Southern group that split up about 11, 12,000 years ago, we can estimate. And the antique board, uh, one more, is, is, is marginally closer related to um, this Southern group than actually the Northern group. And so anyway, we, in our after analysis, the, the remains were given back to the, the Native Americans, which have then reburied uh, those uh, remains. And that's got a lot of discussion. When you have some remains that are 12,000 years old, you know, who should it be repatriated back to? Who does it really belong to? And so on. And that was not solved in this study, and I'm not sure the way that it was handled was the right way, but it's certainly something to think about in the long run in terms of repatriation and so on. For, for remains that are really old, for, there might be descendants of that population that remains come from many places in the world. Uh, in many places in America, in this case, who do the remains really belong to? And I'm not really sure I have the answer to that question, but certainly something that we should think about. It very much came up in another study we did, which is on the Kenway man. So, um, you're probably familiar with, with, with some of these stories. So, the Kenway man, some remains that were found up by the Columbia River in Washington, dated about eight and a half thousand years ago, years before present. Uh, and um, it was found on public land, but was not repatriated because people found it in Ireland. It was not Native American. And then there was lots of research on the Kindred Man. There was a book written about the Kindred Man, and there are various hypotheses of the Kindred Man. Of the, the biological anthropologists that looked at the Kindred Man, there were some of them were arguing that it was a European. Going back to the solution that hypothesis made the European come in. Other people arguing that it was Polynesian. The book uh, about this will contribute to many, many uh, different papers in that book. And uh, if I should check out my sort of uh, my of being a statistician, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm horrified of uh, the status of, of, of some of the research being done in that field, to be honest. Uh, it's clear that you take one single skull, that the ability to assign that to a particular population will be extremely poor. Probably now, statistical analysis will show that. But there seem to be sort of repeated claims by about particular skull who are doing a proper statistical analysis that have been led to some of these problems. So anyway, so so somehow it's the Willis Lemma collaborator, he managed to uh, be allowed, get allowed to uh, do DNA analysis of the Kenwick man. And uh, he did that, and this is again uh, uh, a map of uh, who the Kenwick man is related to. And we could show in fact that the Kenwick man is highly closely related to some groups, and in fact there are some groups, including some of the local people, that have contributed to this, the, the Cobalt tribe that donated DNAs that we can compare to, that in fact, and that's some of the analysis we did in my lab, to show that it's compatible with the Kenwick man being directly ancestral to those groups. That we couldn't reject the hypothesis that the Kenwick man falls directly on the ancestral lineage leading to uh, that group. Right. So it's not only clear that the Kenwick man is clearly Native American. It's also compatible with that the people that live in that area could be descendants of, uh, of uh, the population that the Kindred Man came from. Um, so uh, there's a map that shows within the Americas the affinities to different group by the NC1 boy here. You see this very close signal of stronger affinity to more to some of the southern group, whereas the Kendrick Man also has some of the affinity to some of these groups up here, particularly this cobalt, cobalt tribe. Uh, but there's also some genetic relatedness there. So the story that the way that ended was that we published this paper, and all group in Chicago was then asked if they could verify our results. They verified our results, and the remains were repaired, repatriated, and reburied uh, as a consequence of this. And of course, they raised a lot of questions about um, repatriation and Structured reburial and many other things, and I think those discussions are you know, uh, there are many sides to that discussion. Um, but um, that was uh, sort of the conclusion of, of that. 
Um, I should probably stop now so there's some time for questions. I imagine that people have some questions. We have five minutes left. So I will. I think I will just run directly to Jock or some other sites and Jock to this my endorsement. But the one is, uh, of course, the last one I don't have to elaborate is the slip, which is more than many of these internet stories. I also forgot to put slide apart one of the elaborators on this slide. And then some of the people in my own group that have been doing some work, particularly Kelly Harris, who's now a, a professor at the University of Washington, Yong Wang, uh, and many other uh, people. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Questions? So, in terms of your work in here, you see work like the ancient DNA work that you do. Do you do it all campus? No, so I don't, so I'm really on the computational side. Okay. So I do it okay. all together in collaboration. I'm co-director of a center in Cody where they do all of the work. Okay. So this is all, all the web work is done in Cody Okay. They then send data here and then do data analysis. My team here also supervise some people in Cody So there's no plans of integrated biology to set up an ancient Sadly not. I've been pushing for that, but I haven't been, you know, it does get all the cost money and the other things, you know, you want to start That's something you're interested in, I something that if there are other people that will help me sort of generate some enthusiasm for that. So I'm saying, oh, a shared core facility for ancient DNA, I would be really, really excited to push for that. That's something you may want to chat with. I'd like to watch the research facility. Yeah. That's us. Okay. I can just talk with some other genetics researchers about that. That would be very yeah, interesting. I think, I think we should have a little dinner and drinks. That sounds good. Like <laughs> 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 well, you know, I think we should have a little I wanted to uh, go back to the first part of your talk with the Neanderthals, um, specifically the date of interbreeding at about 55,000, mm -hmm. which strikes me as very, very recent. Uh -huh. um, and I get that it's a, an average, I mean, there's you know, room to wiggle on either end of that spectrum. Um, but my question is more uh, asking your opinion, based on the work that you've done, about how things might change um, thinking about the Near Eastern material. So I'm a Near Eastern mm -hmm. paleontologist. Uh -huh. And so there, there is Neanderthals and Homo sapiens in the same area, so both potentially cohabiting the same area mm -hmm. or alternately occupying the same area or some combination mm -hmm. of that. For you know, our, our recent early dates now are about 200,000 years ago from this day. Mm -hmm. So we have the remains with no ancient DNA from Homo sapiens or Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering that you know that is potentially Neanderthals are disappearing around 15,000 years ago in that area. That's about a hundred and yeah, so so that should suggest that the estimate should be not much older. Well, let me see. Okay, so, um, well, let me see if I get that. So I guess I'm wondering what, what so, you would think might change if we were to um, get Okay, so what would change this estimate? First of all, uh, you know, it could be this, that you have several different dots of, of, of integration, right? So that could be, and, and what you see is that the older integration, because of this natural selection, will have less of that relative to the more recent integration. Um, and another thing that we're not really modeling here, and that now gets, you know, kind of sort of nerd on but that's the, that's the natural selection, and the natural selection change has an effect on these track lengths. And that has not really been taken all into account in any of our estimates. But I don't think it'll double the time, for example. I think that would be very, very unlikely. But they, so I think it's, it's unlikely that you'll get an estimate of 150,000 years. So it's just interesting to think of behaviorally, like that time period matches well with what we think about Homo sapiens moving into Western Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some, you know, some degree of overlap, but not actually a huge amount of time for yeah. interbreeding of these yeah. populations there. But then in the trees, that would suggest very little interbreeding for a long oh, period exactly. of time, and no interbreeding until the very end of the animal population. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I see the issue there. We certainly don't think that the majority of the interbreeding was from Europe because we in fact find a little bit more Neanderthal DNA in East Asia than the Europeans. Yeah, yeah. So 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 we don't think it's it's because the interbreeding mostly happened in Europe. We do think it, it must have been because it spreads about equally on many groups. So it must have happened in the Middle East. I mean, we think uh, there's not really a good model that would allow us to say, oh, it's mostly Europe and then spread all the 
the given mutation rates and the degree value, do you think it still would push Yeah, the mutation rate, this is all based on this recombination clock, so yeah. which I think we know better than the mutation rate. Okay. So, so the mutation rate is a bit more uncertain. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like this data is that we know recombination rate is much better than we know mutation rates. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we, I feel that we get more precise estimates or more reliable estimates with this. That being said, I've been through, you know, now having been in this field since, you know, I was a PhD student here in Berkeley in the mid 90s, I've seen lots of estimates change through time. So if this estimate changed through time, you know, I wouldn't, you know, it was, would I want to, you know, bet my house on it? I'm not going to do that, okay? So let me put it like that. And um, what about uh, folding in the dead organs?
Neanderthal modern human DNA studies first came out was about eight or nine years ago. The, the date cited was more like 90,000. Yeah, and that's been pushed to be more recent. So that, this is the development of more data. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, the early estimates really also, I mean, lots, you know, sometimes you <laughs> know, you kind of know what the answer should be, right? I mean, yeah, you know when, sort of, at that point it was thought that the migration of monitors out of Africa had, was much more recent and it fit with the 90,000 data. So you ended up quite easily with that kind of data. Yeah. So I think it was more, not really driven mostly by the genetic data that day. It was sort of compatible with the data around there. Uh, but of course now we know that the story is much more complex. So. What do you think about the um, use of um, sort of the, the um, open to the public DNA analyses like 23 and me and Ancestry and so forth that are trying to give people a sense of how much the interval they have or don't have? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get bombarded with emails from people that want to be <laughs> There are people that keep telling me that their husband must have more than DNA than this and blah, blah, blah. I, mean, I think it's, I, I think it, honestly, I think, it, I think it's terrible in some sense, right? I mean, there's nothing really that people learn from this that will help them in their lives. Uh, and so there's sort of, some, a lot of the science, the way it's done, it's actually quite well. 23 and me in particular, I have a, students at postdoc that now jobs work with both answers to comment 23 and me. The science that they're doing, I think, is very good and rigorous both places. But it's in the issue of giving people information that they don't have a context to ensure it. And there's some, some degree sets in the snake oil, right? Because people don't have the context to fully understand what this means. And they think it means more than it means. It doesn't really mean much most of the time, right? We have 5% increase of getting some disease. Well, you know, 5% over 0 0.0001% is still really small, right? So, so generally, I think people don't understand that uh, it has a potential for doing more harm than good. So I'm, I'm in favor of that medical information to be given for your uh, health, you know, your, your medical, your primary physician to give you medical information. It shouldn't be something where you send your stuff out to them instead of get information back, for example. I think the Neanderthal thing is pretty, uh, that perhaps doesn't matter much, but it changes some of people's, you know, People think that, that the genetic information will overwrite their cultural identity somehow, and it fits their cultural identity. And that's where I have the biggest problem, perhaps, right? That people think that genetics can sort of overrule their identity. And, and, and I think that the sort of proliferation of 23 and me and Ancestry Common and all those companies help you know, push that in some sense, that you are your, your genes, that that is more important than your real cultural identity. And that I have perhaps the biggest problem. Do you think it's possible 23andMe told me that my mother's haplogroup left the Middle East around 26,000 years ago? Yeah. Uh, so that is from mitochondrial DNA. So yeah. that's, that's molecular clock. You know, that, there will be a confidence interval of that right. estimate. But of course, the, the interpretation is here that you had some you know, relatives there 26,000 years ago, right? <laughs> but actually, how people, that was what I started by saying. There's not a uh, geolocation. So those ancestors could have moved around many different places in the world. And the DNA doesn't really tell you about that. So therefore, I do have a little bit of a problem with that. Yeah, right. Just because the, you know, we don't know when they actually were those ancestors. Yeah, yeah. It's just an indirect inference between by relatedness to, to other people. That they certainly have the patients today. Right. Yeah, well, I really like it because I'm a the archaeologist and I worked around 17 to 20,000 years ago in South Central Europe. So the idea that my mom's family was on the move and getting to Europe about my, my period. <laughs> <laughs> 